Hey gang, and welcome to another worksheet solutions walkthrough for the worksheet, acid-base review, substitution, elimination, introduction. So you know the drill by now. You've tried this corresponding worksheet. Maybe you're looking for a little bit more context as to how the answers got arrived at. Well, you are in the right place. We're gonna go through this worksheet. You're gonna see how I did all these answers, you know, all these problems, arrived at the answers, and hopefully give you all the explanations you were looking for. So let's do it. Okay, gang, like I mentioned in the instructional video, acid-base chemistry is so important to where we're going as far as learning about SN2, E2, SN1, E1. So why not a refresher? So in problem one, these are just the first three, and then I'll pause the video, we'll throw up the last two. You know, it's just a throwback to pick the favorite side of equilibrium because remember, these are equilibriums. They are not completions going from reactants to products, right? We have forward and reverse directions going on, but one side's favored. One direction's happening more than the other. So we need to pick the side, but then we also need to answer a follow-up question as far as identifying weakest acid, strongest base, strongest acid, weakest, you know, strongest base, etc. whatever. So if we look up here, I hope you are thinking oxygen and sulfur, right? We have two atoms bearing a negative charge. Who handles it better, right? Because nature likes to go to where we are the most stable. And in acid-base world, stable equals weak. Remember, we drive to the weak as far as, uh, you know, in terms of acid-base equilibrium because that is the side that is the most stable and nature likes to be low energy. So if we take a look here, remember, it's a size thing. That's right, it matters. Same column for the atoms bearing this negative charge. So who handles it better? The atom that allows the charge to spread out more evenly over itself. So this side is favored in equilibrium. The weakest acid, okay? So if we look, right, we've identified the stable side of the equilibrium. That's where the weak, uh, you know, part of the uh, equation is. So the weakest acid, the acid on this side is H2O. Okay? Because the strongest, the strongest acid would be H2S. Now the strongest base, that obviously this is this is the weak side, this is the strong side, hydroxide. The strongest base is the base that actually does its job. Okay? Moving on here. So we see two structures bearing negative charge on both sides of this equilibrium. I hope you are realizing this is these two atoms are in the same period, right? The same row, this is an electronegativity thing. Which atom is more comfortable housing that negative charge? Well, oxygen is more electronegative than nitrogen. Oxygen is more stable holding onto this charge, meaning this, you know, meaning this OH minus is the weaker base. So this is the side favored equilibrium. So if we were going to identify the weakest acid, well the weakest acid is on this side, and it's you know the side that actually has H plus to donate. So it's ammonia, the NH3. Okay? Now the strongest base, well, this is our strong side and this happens to be the base, the negative charge, right? The side looking to pick up H+. Cool. Now if we take a gander down here, once again, these two, the phosphorus and the AS, arsenic, right? That is, again, once again, a size thing. And you would have a periodic table, so no, no worries there. Who handles the negative charge better, the arsenic here or the phosphorus here? Well, it is very clearly the arsenic on the left-hand side. Now, the strongest acid. Strongest acid means we are not looking at this side of the equilibrium, we're looking at this side. So it is the hydro, hydro arsenic acid. I don't remember how to say that. The H3AAS. And the weakest base. Well, the weakest base is gonna be on this side, and it's gonna be the side that's looking to pick up H plus, right? On this side, but it's the weakest base. So this would be the H2AS minus. So really, we just got a conjugate, you know, we got an acid base pairing right here that we had to answer, you know, as far as what we are, you know, had to identify. So let me erase this, throw up the last two, and we'll be done with problem one. To finish out problem one, we have two more equilibria. So if we look up here, I hope you're immediately picking up on the fact that we have an sp3 carbon housing a negative charge, and over here, an sp2 carbon. So remember, one of the rules of acid-base, you know, uh, stability is that for hybridization, that's one of our kind of five rules. And something that has an, an atom that has more S character, right, can house electrons, a lone pair, closer to the nucleus where the protons live. So that's, you know, a favorable electrostatic, re, uh, you know, stabilization effect. So if we take a look here, who handles this negative charge better? This sp3 carbon or this sp2 carbon? Clearly the sp2 carbon. So this equilibrium is favored. We've identified 
the weak side, right? The stable side of this equilibrium. So weak is acid. It would be this structure right here because as weird as it is to think about this donating H+, plus, but in reverse, that's what the role it plays is. And our strongest, let me use the black, or let me use the red. And our strongest base, so this is our strong side. This right here is our strongest base, which makes sense, right? Because this thing does not handle the negative charge as well. It's unstable, it's gonna do its job. Okay, so now going to our last one. I think this is a pretty commonsensical one, but remember, one of the, you know, the reason why this equilibria goes the way it does, equilibrium, is because of one of the rules we talked about. Clearly, this is the side that will uh, you know, be favored at equilibrium, and it's because H2SO4 is a super, super strong acid, right? And the reason why is because, oh, and I'm now realizing I drew this a little bit wonky, and I apologize. I misdrew this, and I am very sorry. This is H3O+. Plus. I knew something was weird. Okay, so my bad, gang. Nothing changes. This is still the side favorite equilibrium. We didn't have con conservation of charge. The reason being is because, right, H2SO4, when it donates H+, plus, it has a slew of resonance. That's why th it makes the conjugate base of H, you know, this is bisulfate, so stable. So this is a super strong acid. This is a super, super, super weak, stable conjugate base. Water, H2O+, plus, they don't even, you know, H3O+, plus is in terms of beating out this acid, no chance. So the weakest acid is H3O+, plus, because that's our weak side. And our strongest base is going to be water, because that is our strong side, and that's the role water plays over here, is as a base. Okay, gang, sorry for that little hiccup. On to problem two. Okay, gang, so in problem two, all we're doing is labeling. So, easy work. So, I have nine molecule structures up here for you, and all we need to do is label them with the new terminology we learned, whether this thing is a nucleophile, a lover of positive charge, or an electrophile, a lover of negative charge. So really, we kind of need to just look at the makeup of the structure or the, you know, the atom, uh, the molecule, and see is it positive, is it negative, or is it partial positive, is it partial negative? So if we take a look up here, this is something we're gonna use at the end of OCHEM1 uh, as a, it's a very good nucleophile, right? If we can see this, this sp carbon has a negative alone pair on it. It even has a full-blown negative charge on it because if we do the formal charge, this carbon, one, two, three, four, five, negative charge. So because it's negative, it will like positive things. So this is a nucleophile, a lover of positive charge. Moving over here. So we have bromine, and if we look at the formal charge, one, two, three, four, five, six, bromine has a plus one charge here. We have a bro, uh, bromine cation here. Not, you know, not a form we typically see for bromine. However, bromine being positive, what would it like to kind of get involved with? Something negative. So this is an electrophile. And I'm gonna start abbreviating from the, you know, the rest of the way out. So this is hydroxide, it's negative, it's gonna like something positive. So this is a nucleophile, so I'll label this as a nuke. Over here, so this one's a little less obvious, but remember, water in its Lewis dot structure is going to be sucking electron density, you know, basically controlling most of the electrons in these bonds with hydrogen, so it is a partial negative charge on it. So it has more negative charge than usual. As a result, this is going to be a nucleophile. Not a good one, but a nucleophile nonetheless. Now we have AlCl3. I think what you're gonna see here is that these chlorines, much more electronegative than the aluminum, so they will be stealing electron density from aluminum in every situation. So there's gonna be a pretty fat delta plus on the aluminum delta plus. So this will be an electrophile. I'm gonna label that elec. Okay, over here. So this is hydrogen with two lone pair, or sorry, with two electrons, a lone pair. So this is actually hydride. We will use this not too far away from this video. So super negative, it's a nucleophile. Since it's negative, it's gonna be a lover of positive charge. Don't know why I just wrote that out in the full word, but I did. Down here, this carbon is full blown positive. It's gonna to wanna to get involved in some negative electrophile. Over here, 
negative oxygen, nucleophile, and this is just uh, H plus, electrophile. Definitely wants to get involved with something negative, lover of negative charge. Okay, gang, and that's it for problem two. Problem three is just as easy, so let's finish this worksheet. Okay, gang, so for problem three, again, super easy, nine molecules, we just have to label them all, let's do it. So we have nine solvents here, and our choices here is that we just need to identify them as nonpolar, polar protic, or polar aprotic. So remember, nonpolar means you have no electronegative molecules, um, you know, causing a dipole moment, or you know, you don't have symmetry. Symmetry matters. Uh, for polar protic, right? So you're going to have some type of electronegative atom causing a dipole moment, as well as you're going to have a strong electronegative atom bonded directly to hydrogen. That makes it protic. Polar aprotic is the fact that you're going to have some type of polar character to the molecule, but you're going to be missing that electronegative atom directly bonded to hydrogen. So if we take a look here, this is just cyclohexane. This is a nonpolar solvent. Super, super straightforward. Now, if we look at here, we just have propanol, but I hope you're seeing, okay, there's a dipole moment here, as well as here is a protic situation. Now, when we mean protic, we mean that there's a strong delta H plus present in the molecule. And that's because, right, oxygen is stealing so much electron density away from that hydrogen. So this is what we would call polar protic. Okay, so now going over here to dimethylformamide or, you know, <laughs> nicely abbreviated DMF, we have, you know, we definitely have some polar character going on, right? You don't have to, you know, be completely sure, right? But there's no symmetry canceling anything out. Definitely polar. There's definitely going to be some dipole moments. So it's polar. Now is it protic? DMF is a bit of a weird one because if you look at it, there's actually no direct electronegative atom bonded directly to hydrogen, right? Nitrogen, you know, there's no NH bond or OH bond or CLH bond. So this is polar aprotic. So I hope you're getting the gist of how this is working because it's going to be very important for us to identify solvents for when we do SN2E2, SN1E1. So here, this is carboxylic acid, right? So this, we see the protic character. We know it's polar. This is polar protic. This is acetone, okay? So it's polar, definitely polar, but there's no direct OH bond. So it's polar aprotic. Now, diethyl ether is like slightly, 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 slightly polar, but it's generally regarded as a non-polar solvent. And that's because of the symmetry that you kind of have going on, okay? So water, polar protic. Definitely, we see, you know, there's polar character as well as the fact that there's two OH bonds, okay? So polar protic. Over here, dimethyl sulfoxide or DMSO looks just like acetone, but with a sulfur right here. This, definitely polar aprotic, right? Definitely polar, but we see no direct, you know, electronegative atom bonded right to hydrogen. And then over here for acetonitrile, same thing, polar aprotic. Okay, gang, so thank you for rocking with me on this worksheet that I know it seemed maybe a bit trivial. I know it seemed a bit like, why is this here? I'm telling you, if you know your solvents and you can identify them and you're good with that terminology and you have acid-based stuff fresh in your mind and you know how to you know, use nucleophile and electrophile as terms and labels, you're going to be A-OK -okay for SN2, E2, SN1, E1. If you're watching this video, that means you've thrown me some money and you've supported Joe Chem, and I cannot thank you enough. I'm so humbled that you're using Joe Chem to help propel yourself through OCHEM 1 and OCHEM 2 with flying colors. I hope to be here now and then, you know, at the very end. But if anything, I hope to see you all in the next video.